better. Pulpit. 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 I reset the bell pack. Is it working now? Sound is not working. We're in week nine of, a, of 11 of what we've been calling the Happiness Project. Uh, we've been looking at the book of Philippians, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, very small book, four chapters, three to five pages, depending on what publication of the Bible you have. But yet in those small pages, great things, more than 17 times the concept of happiness is alluded to. It is, quite arguably, the happiest book in the Bible. And as we come to week nine, just two more weeks to go, I'll remind you of what I said to you almost six weeks ago when we started all this, is that there are five overall, uh, uh, well, foundational principles that Paul uh, assembles this lesson upon. And that is that you don't look for happiness, you create it. And that you uh, create happiness in this life uh, not by making it a goal, like if I do and accomplish and acquire and accomplish and do, eventually sometime I'll be happy. Or, quote, rather, you create happiness in your life by making right choices, by choosing to be happy making choices that are God-pleasing and faith-renewing. We've talked about 37 happiness hints up until this time and five more today, making it 42. And that happiness that is based on an event is very short-term, short-lived happiness. Go to Disneyland, have a great time, get home, get the Visa card bill, and all of a sudden you're irate because somebody spent $17.38 on Coca-Cola. What do you mean doing that? You're not happy anymore. But the happiness that lasts is happiness that is based on, well, your relationship with Jesus Christ. And that happy habits, these happiness hints, if you will employ them in your life, they'll be just as addicting as the self-destructive habits that you're already, well, that you're using thinking they're making you happy that they'll replace. And so the text today is, again, page 1,262, picking up where we left off last week, chapter 4, beginning with uh, verse 6. Turn your attention to God's Word, Christ, His expectation and instruction is promised to you this day. Philippians 4, page 1262, beginning with verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving present your request to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through Christ who gives me strength. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be unto God. News headlines that I've been bombarded with this week are really quite shocking and increasingly and continually more and more shocking. I just couldn't believe I'd hear anything more. But all of a sudden this week headlines were about something called the opioid epidemic. And all of a sudden I'm, I'm told in news media that Suicide and overdose are some of the greatest killers in America, the greatest of accidental killers in America today, more than even automobile accidents, suicide, overdose. That three people will die of an opioid overdose this 
morning while we're in this worship service somewhere in America or more. It's, it's uh, more people dying of this than, than another broadcaster said uh, than heart disease or smoking related illnesses. I'm going, what, what is it? It even uh, caused the president to take notice this week. And we've got a national emergency that's been proclaimed. In another uh, media report I saw this week, it, it, it even went so far, this bill, the news bills, news bills, uh, that, that worldwide stress is at all-time highest level since World War II, since the Nazis were taking over the world. My goodness, what's going on? So I did some personal research. Barbara, that means I Googled. I Googled what? stresses Americans. And I got a list of, of, of American stressors. And, and, and of course, number one was your job or worrying about your career. Number two, your money or worrying about your debt. Health or health care. Number four was relationships. Number five was diet. Doc, I don't have any trouble about that. I gave up worrying about you know. <coughs> Media and media information overlord. No, no, number six. Number seven, a lack of sleep. Number eight, looking for a parking place at Avalon. <laughs> I just made that one up. There was just seven. Today in the Happiness Project, happiness tents, choices you can make to have a happier life. From Paul's letter in Philippians, we're looking at Essentially, in this section, how apropos, what a perfect moment. We get to the biblical moment of biblical authority on your own personal stress management. On the week, we proclaim a national health care crisis. First happiness hint today. Exactly how Paul wrote it to the Philippians almost 2,000 years ago to you and I this morning. Read with me Philippians 4, verse 6. Never worry about anything. That is stress management. That's a stress management policy that wasn't cooked up by a publisher or a prescriber or a guru. It's a stress management policy that was created and guaranteed by God above. It's a promise. It's a promise that in verse 7, Paul writes, will give you peace that surpasses all understanding. And what that, what that means is, what that situation describes, peace surpassing all understanding, is that th those, who, those who follow these happiness ends, they can be surrounded by personal crisis, total chaos, Complete meltdown of those around them, absolute tension, and with everything going on completely unexpected and unanticipated, yet still inside, for no logical reason at all, you will be at peace. A peace that is beyond reason or logic that surpasses, surpasses anything else. Peace of mind that surpasses even understanding itself. God's promise to those, well, who follow these happiness hymns. Jesus was very, was very intense upon this point. In His greatest sermon recorded, and I think Jesus probably repeated this sermon many times, but it was recorded word for word. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. It starts with the Beatitudes. And then halfway through, Jesus turns to the topic of personal stress and worry. And Jesus makes three points about all of our human anxieties. First thing he says is, worry is unreasonable. Read with me from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, verse 25. Don't worry about your life, about your eat or drink, or about your body. What you will wear is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes. Jesus is saying here that worry is unreasonable. It's unreasonable to worry. I mean, worry doesn't help anything. Worry always exaggerates 
the circumstance. And the more you worry about it, the bigger it gets. I mean, to worry about something that you have no control over, well, that's a waste of time. And to worry about something that you can change, well, that's just foolish. Stop worrying and make the change. Make the choice. In either case, Jesus is saying here that worry and the life of worry is just unreasonable. Jesus goes on on the Sermon on the Mount and He states that worry is something quite unnatural. Read with me from, from His sermon, verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And why worry about clothes? Look at the field lilies. They don't worry about theirs. Yet King Solomon in all his glory was never clothed as beautifully as they. Jesus is saying here that worry is quite unnatural. It's an unnatural state you were not created to live in. I mean, look of all the creatures in creation. Plants don't worry. Trees don't worry. Stones don't worry. Rivers don't worry. The ocean doesn't worry. And of the animals, dogs don't worry. Cats don't worry. They cause worries, but they don't worry. Cows don't worry. Birds don't worry. Bats don't worry. They just fly around in Truesdale Hall. People created in the image of God. They're the only creatures on this planet that don't trust God, their Creator, enough and worry. It's just not natural. No one was created to be a born worrier. We learn to worry. We, we, we're taught that by, by, by culture, by example of other people. But just like you learn to worry about every little detail and not be at peace, God is saying, well, look at the birds of the air and learn a different lesson. You can learn to make better choices, happier choices. You can come to learn that, that, that worrying is just not natural. Look what we say about when we're worried. How are you today? Oh, I'm, I'm worried sick. That's right, worry. It's not natural. It's not a natural state. It'll affect your health. I'm worrying myself to death. That's insane, isn't it? Well, give it up. You're not made to worry. It's unnatural. But quite rather, you were created to trust in God for all things. Jesus keeps on driving this point home. We're still in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus goes on. He says, worry is completely unhelpful. Matthew 6, 27. Let's read it out loud. Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? Jesus tells us worry, it's, it's unhelpful. Worrying is ineffective to change anything. Worry can't change what's past. Worry can't change what's future or what's here in the present. But worry can certainly make your past, present, and future miserable. A miserable mess. It's unhelpful. Worry is a lot of energy spent going nowhere. Worrying is like going out on the front porch, sitting down in the rocking chair, rocking as hard as you can and think you're going to get to town. It won't get you anywhere. It's unhelpful. Jesus goes on, Sermon on the Mount, verse 30. He makes a point. It's also unnecessary. Read with me verse 30. If God cares so wonderfully for the flowers that are here today and gone tomorrow, won't He be more surely care for you, O ye of little faith? Jesus is saying here that worry is unreasonable, unnatural, unhelpful, and unnecessary. You know why it's unnecessary? Because you have a heavenly Father. God is your heavenly Father. And when I was a boy and I had a need or thought I needed something, I went to my Father and I would ask Him that I need this. And if I needed it, I usually got it. And I really, I got more than I asked for. And, and I had a great childhood. I, I received more than, than, than I really needed. But when I would ask my 
my dad for something. When I was 16, I expected a brand new car for some reason. When I asked my, God, my dad for something, I never worried one moment where he was going to get the money to do it. I figured it was my job to ask and his job to give. See, I didn't worry. I just knew that he would take care of my needs. So don't worry. You have a heavenly father who cares infinitely more about you. He cares so much that he gave his only begotten son for you. He withholds nothing. So don't worry. Just, just ask. How much more will God provide for you than the birds or the flowers or anything else? Our first happiness hint today is in a stressed out land declaring a national emergency on addiction, stress. Refuse any longer to worry. But rather, happiness in two, rather than worrying, talk to God about everything. Philippians 6, let's continue reading the lesson together today. Never worry about anything. Instead, in every situation, let God know what you need in your prayers and requests. When I find myself in times of personal worry, I, as quick as I can, Try to grab, grab the board and, and clear the board and ask myself a new question. Have I prayed about this? Have I talked to God about this? Because I know, don't panic, worship. Don't worry, pray. Don't give up, talk it out with Christ, your Savior, the Savior of all the world. Jesus says, Talk to God about everything. His brother James, the first um, uh, leader in the New Jerusalem church, uh, James would write something he heard his half older brother Jesus say many times. Uh, James 4 2, read it with me. You do not have because you do not ask God. You have not because you ask not. Jesus would tell his disciples. Trust in God for all things, for everything that you need, for all your needs. That's what you're created to do, not to worry. Trust that God is willing, who is willing to give His Son on your behalf, withholds nothing and will withhold nothing that you genuinely need. So talk to God about everything. Today's second happiness hymn. Third happiness in this morning. Continually thank God in all things. Read with me how Paul writes it in verse 6. When you ask God for what you need, also thank Him for all He's done. This is a stress buster, a worry eliminator. Here it goes. Choose not to worry about anything any longer, but rather talk to God about everything. And while you're busy talking to God, remember to thank God in all things. Now notice all things. It doesn't mean for all things. You don't have to, you're not expected to thank God for things that are evil or bad, an illness, a natural disaster, a crime. And, and man's inhumanity to man. You don't thank God for the evil and the ugly in this world, but you can always thank God for the first responders who risked their life to help people who were in the natural disaster. You can thank God for those who went out of their way to provide for the needs of those who were, well, recovering from grief or struggling in the illness. You can thank God for all things, but you don't, you're not expected to thank God. Um, you can thank God in all things, but you are not expected to have to thank God for all things. Everything is not, is not good. But every time the bad stuff comes, you can still find cause to thank God. Here is, here is the point of increased Christian spiritual maturity this morning. Here, here it comes. Culture lays out life like a spreadsheet. 
or a graph board. And we kind of think about in business and in industry, we track the upslope. And as things go up, that's good. And if there's a downward turn, then that's bad. So when things are bad going down, we look forward that one day we'll be happy because I'm sure one day it'll start going up again. Here is the Christian spiritual maturity point for today. Life, your life, is not a flow chart. But real life, human life, created in the image of God, in this fallen, broken world on a spiritual pilgrimage to heaven and everlasting life, it's more like a train. And a train runs on two tracks. Left and right track. You know, two tracks. And a train that goes into its future destination, uh, its wheels connect to the foundation, to the ground. It's grounded on, on the two tracks. And in and, and your life, it's like one track is the blessing track. It's the goodness, the sweetness, the joy, the perfect moments of this life. And rather than thinking of them in terms of it's bad today and I'm hoping one day it'll be better, realize that there's always the goodness of God, of something of this life that's, in, that's running through every day of your life. And you're on that track. And then, of course, simultaneously, you're connected to another track over here. And this other track, well, that's life's trials and temptations and difficulties and, and just the very evidence that you and I need a Savior and this is a broken world in need of salvation, in need of God's fixing. And we have to simultaneously, not like a flow chart, this is a good day, that's a bad day, I'm hoping another good day comes, but we realize in any day, in any circumstances, living above the circumstances of this life on the bad track over here, we can always be encouraged, no matter how bumpy this track over here gets, that this track, well, this track is the track to everlasting life. Two tracks in life. You are not a flow chart. Or as we're told in the letter to the church at Thessalonica, in some of the oldest writings of the Apostle Paul. Read it with me. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Fourth happiness in today, think about God always. Think about good things always. Fill your mind, fill your heart, fill your life. I know it might be fun to gossip. It might be fun to, you know, to... to, to, to to harbor revenge or a hateful thought. Human beings. Very human to get it. But rather than doing that, think about good things always. What's, what's Paul's example? I'm going to read it to you. Catch these words from verse 8. Fill your minds with things that are true. Our world barely knows what truth is anymore. So often we determine that truth is whoever is screaming the loudest. And that's not so. Fill your mind with that is, which is true, with that which is good, with that which is right. Think about things that are pure, beautiful, respected, excellent. Think about things that are worthy of honor. Think about things that are worthy for you to think about. Think about those things. You see, the battleground of stress is not out here in space. The battleground for stress and worry is between your ears. Now, I'm not saying it's all in your mind. No, your stress is very real. But it's going on in your mind. And if you fill your mind with things that fuel the fear and the stress, you will be more stressed out and afraid. But Paul says make a happiness hint here. Make a happy choice, a better choice for happier, more faithful living. Let's choose rather to fill our minds with the good and the right and the pure and the beautiful and respectful and honorable and honorable. And there's a lot of noble things that fill one or two. But if you really think about those seven categories, there's only one that simultaneously fulfills all seven categories at the same time. And do you know what that one is? It's Jesus Christ. Fill your minds 
with how much God loves you and your connection to Christ, your Savior. Isaiah, the prophet in the Old Testament, said of those who would do that, he said, read it with me. You, Lord, will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you and whose thoughts are fixed on you. Corey Ten Boom, the, the uh, Dutch daughter of a Jewish shoemaker in Amsterdam during World War II, hiding from the Nazis and the Holocaust. One day she saw her parents and family drove off. She was cared for and hidden by a Christian, a Christian community in Amsterdam. Her movie is called um, um, The Hiding Place. If you've ever heard that story, she writes in her memoirs, If you look at the world, you will be distressed. If you look within, you'll be depressed. If you look at Christ, you'll be at rest. At rest. Fix your thoughts on God. He promises you something. He promised those who make these good choices. Peace that surpasses understanding. Finally, fifth and last happiness hint for today. Be content with your things. The Apostle Paul would write to us, I know what it is to be full and have plenty. I know what it is to be hungry and in need. And I have learned to be content whatever my circumstances are. Let me explain contentment to you. Contentment's not being lazy. Contentment's not apathy or complacency or fatalism. Contentment is not a lack of ambition. Oh, brother, we know the Apostle Paul was filled with ambition. He built churches everywhere he went across what was known world to him. And he was content. Contentment is, well, enjoying what you have right now. You're not waiting for something else to come your way or waiting for somebody else to come and make you happy. You're not postponing and waiting to be happy when you get something else. That's coveting. Coveting is when you want something else that somebody else has. Contentment is the very opposite of coveting. Contentment is the realization that I can be happy with what I have right now because I have a connection with Jesus Christ. When I was a boy, I don't know, 12, 13 year old Christmas, I got a stingray bicycle. Stingray bicycle. Banana seat, a sissy bar, a rear tire looked like a drag tire on a drag racer. Those high-rise handlebars. I got a stingray bicycle. I hadn't even asked for it. It just appeared. I was so excited. It's the coolest thing in the world. I went outside to ride it. The boy next door, whose father was the manager of a local department store, he got one that was three speeds. I was crushed. <laughs> His was better than mine. Contentment is giving up those childish kind of things and learning to celebrate with Jesus Christ what you have right now. And those who have that kind of connection that brings that pure promise of peace that surpasses understanding, well, they get something, they get something very special. A special kind of life. A living connection to God above. And that's what we're talking about these last two months here at Avalon. We're calling just that the happiness project. May God bless our food. May God bless our fellowship. May God bless you this day. May God bless our church family. And may God cause you to make happy decisions. In the name of Christ, I do ask and pray. I say amen. The concluding hymn is number 670.